Thank you very much and welcome everybody. I'm so glad that you've joined us today and we are going to be covering a very important element here on investigating workplace misconduct. Uh, it is about more than just harassment and it is a critical step in minimizing liability. So let's get started. Um, whoops. So for whatever reason, okay, there is a uh, bio to give you a little bit more information. My website is there and you know, if, hey, if you're like me, I sit through these or I sit through a training session and I get done and I think, doggone, I wish I would have asked such and such a question. So if after the webinar you would like to contact me, there is my phone number and there is my email, please feel free to do so. Okay, what is it we're going to be covering today? Well, we'll identify some of the events that should trigger an investigation. Um, and I'm assuming that all of you that are on today are HR, so I will be addressing my comments from that perspective. But there's many things that trigger an investigation, so we'll be looking at that. What are the steps of an investigation, and what are some techniques in questioning? Because the questions that you ask will make a difference, obviously, in the answers that you receive. Just like when we use a survey to glean individual employees' thoughts and feelings about the organization, we need to make sure that those questions are valid and reliable. Well, it's kind of the same thing when you're doing an interview and doing an investigation. So what is quality documentation? I work as an expert witness for uh, lawsuits and primarily dealing with bullying and with um, harassment, but also with negligence and sometimes other forms of misconduct. And what I find in my work is that the documentation is often non-existent, or if it does exist, it might be chicken scratching here and there on some yellow legal pads. So the documentation is extremely important. We'll look at privacy issues. Um, and we'll explain what are some of the guidelines if you need to search, if you need to search a person or a locker or a desk, for example. How do you determine credibility? Um, how do you reach conclusions? That's a tough one that folks um, don't know how to do. And what are some of the laws that might be influencing whatever investigation? excuse me, that you will be conducting. There are a ton of them. What are some of the challenging situations that you might run into? And then finally, how do you write a final report? And that final report, again, is critical. So, by the way, periodically, I'll probably be taking a small po uh, pause to take a drink of water, just a FYI. So let's look at what some of the triggers might be to conduct an investigation. And I'm just going to throw these up here for you to peruse through. Quite a bit, huh? So if any of these things occur within your organization, they may be the very triggers that we are talking about that do require an investigation. All right, so keep those in mind. Now let's take a look at the laws that require an investigation. Well, certainly we've got all of the anti-discrimination laws. So Title VII, if any of you are schools, that would also be Title IX. Now Title IX might also play a role, even if you're in the workplace, if you've got any students that are there as part of their schooling. So the American Disabilities Act, Age Discrimination and Employment Act, uh, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, uh, and so forth. So all of your civil rights anti-discrimination laws. OSHA is a big one, all right? Um, your Drug-Free Workplace Act. SOX, of course, we hear about that. Securities Acts, uh, Department of Transportation Regulations, and good old HIPAA. Now, um, we also know that there is a new law, the Section 1557 
of the Affordable Care Act. Now that is dealing with any kind of discrimination against patients that fall under uh, many of the civil rights acts of discrimination. This is a new law that came about this summer and it applies to any pharma uh, pharmacy, any healthcare provider, and also health insurance. And for those of you that are not healthcare providers in any way, but you have health insurance that you provide for your employees, you will need to ensure that your health insurance company provides gender transition care and that they provide for any of the surgery or hormone replacement, et cetera. So that's brand new. Let's look at these federal and state laws a little bit more. Title VII, of course, I'm gonna assume you're familiar with, the um, uh, uh, eight, uh, American Disabilities Act Amendment Act, we'll just call it the ADA, the a, um, Age in, um, Discrimination and Employment Act, Title IX I mentioned, and then make sure that you know what your state's Human Rights Act is, and uh, you may be calling it a Civil Rights Act or who knows what your state calls it. I would also make sure that whatever city you are in, that you are aware of whatever laws they have. Uh, for example, they may have some laws that your state and the federal government does not. Uh, for LGBT, for example, there are some cities that protect the lesbian, gay, bisexual employee, even though the state does not. Uh, and then transgender employees are protected under Title VII. Uh, so I put down the LGBT, it should be uh, at a Q on that for questioning. And then we've got the Pregnancy Discrimination Act is another one, and then GINA, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. So these are some of the federal and state laws and just some of them that you need to be aware of. Let's look at some tort laws, okay? Now a tort is any kind of a claim that an individual can bring against you if they feel that they have been injured. And even though bullying, for example, there is no legal um, liability that an individual employee can bring against you for bullying, however that might be described, but it is a form of misconduct. And that can, in fact, be, um, since there is no liability, you can end up using any of these tort laws not you, but the employee can to bring a charge against you. So be aware of those. Also be aware of whatever laws exist that deal with social media within your state. And then of course, however your policy reads as well. So it's social media um, and it's anything with IT. Now, why in the world would you conduct a workplace investigation in the first place? Well, First of all, you want to determine, hey, have any of our policies and procedures been violated? And remember that list I gave you of types of misconduct or what can trigger an investigation. I'm going to hope and make an assumption that you've probably got policies and procedures against most of those forms of misconduct. So you want to investigate to determine whether any of those policies and procedures have been violated. You want to assure that your employees are in fact abiding by what your organization's uh, goals are, the mission statement, your values, what's your foundation of your organization. Um, you wanna make sure that you are facilitating appropriate discipline, including teachable moments. You of course are concerned about the quality of whatever product or service that you offer, because that is your livelihood. You want to do investigations so that there is informed decision-making that's based on fact. And you want to reduce your liability exposure to any claims um, which would tie in with risk management. Okay, so is there a duty to investigate? What do you think? Well, Federal and state laws dealing with discrimination and harassment, yes, you must investigate, all right? There is no discretion 
on those laws dealing with discrimination as to whether or not you will or will not investigate, even if the employee requests that you do not. So even if the complainant that comes to you is a chronic complainer and you're thinking, oh, my gosh, here we go again, you still need to do the investigation. And it's not quite as clear about investigating misconduct that occurs off the premises. Um, it's going to depend upon what type of misconduct. And I would, if this occurs, always check with your attorney. Now, you've got two kinds of attorneys, I'm assuming. One would be more of a corporate attorney, and the other one would be an employment lawyer. And for anything dealing with discrimination, make sure that you deal with your employment lawyer. Some of the other triggers that I listed, it may be your employment lawyer, but it might be your um, uh, corporate counsel as well. So let's take a look.